Right, so today yeah, we'll talk about what, what, what are often called executive functions or uh, frontal lobe functions, really. And the, the photograph here kind of uh, you know, illustrates an analogy with the, uh, with the frontal lobes or this kind of executive being like a conductor and the rest of the brain being like an orchestra. Uh, so all the elements of the orchestra can function independently without having a conductor. But in order for the thing to work as a whole, you need the conductor there to bring on the timing to make sure that one group plays when the other one is silent and, uh, uh, and so on. So you need this level of organisation there to make something kind of coordinated and seemingly controlled. Uh, one of the interesting things, one of the kind of pitfalls of this metaphor is that it potentially leads to what, what some people call an infinite regress, in that you could then ask the question, what is in this person's head? What's kind of controlling him? You know, he's the controller, but how, you know, what, what, what's controlling him? So the, the idea is, how can you kind of control everything without having something that is kind of controlling you, if that makes any sense? So, uh, so the analogy, you know, is good up until a point, and we'll talk about how. So why, why do we uh, need the, the, these executive functions? If each kind of member of the orchestra can function independently, why do we even need something to them together? I think here it's, it's to do with kind of optimizing performance. But also, it, it's not the case that we always need it. There are plenty of uh, situations in which we don't necessarily need it. So it's not the case that it's always there. So what's kind of interesting is when we need it uh, and when we don't. So I think one situation we need it is when you've got multiple operations that need to be coordinated, maybe in a completely different way, that you're trying to bring do X whilst think about Y, for instance. You haven't got a specialised routine for doing X whilst thinking about Y, so you need something that will enable these operations to be put together on the fly, if you will. Um, the other <coughs> reason which I, I think is also critical is this distinction between automatic and controlled behavior, or automatic and what's called, often called strategic behavior, or deliberate, as opposed to automatic. So the idea is that all the, uh, the kind of other elements of the brain can, to some extent, uh, function in this kind of autopilot mode, this kind of automatic mode. But there are some situations in which you need to stop doing that and kind of concentrate. So the analogy that, that's often uh, done here is to do with driving, for instance, so a very complex skill. But often you might kind of drive for five minutes and think, God, I must have you know, driven along this road and stopped at the lights, but I've got no recollection of it. You know, are you kind of unconscious? Were you, you know, exerting kind of cognitive control? Well, to some extent, you probably were a little bit, but you might be in this kind of autopilot mode. Then all of a sudden, when something unexpected happens as a diversion, then all of a sudden you need to kind of think about your actions, think about your uh, way home, and, and so on. So you, you need to interrupt automatic behavior. <coughs> Or, or sometimes, you know, you, you might need to kind of attend more to what you're doing. So attention to action, for instance, would be something related to executive functions, kind of monitoring, see whether you're doing, what you're doing is correct, or whether you're just, you know, uh, functioning kind of, in kind of autopilot. So, <clears throat> so executive functions is kind of this uh, more cognitive entity, but it's been linked specifically to uh, a particular anatomy, and particularly to the frontal lobes, or a part of the frontal lobes. Uh, and you can see that different species kind of have different proportions of that. So humans have a much uh, higher, a uh, much larger proportion of their brain dedicated to uh, the frontal lobes than other uh, the species. And again, this, this is kind of linked to lay notions of intelligence. So not working in this kind of automatic way, being able to be flexible, coordinate multiple activities in novel ways is seen as being what it is to be intelligent, really. Um, and we can, we can think about social intelligence as well. It's, it's something that we will uh, come across as well. So intelligence in the strictly cognitive terms, but maybe also in the social world as well. Uh, and we, we'll talk a bit about that. Not all of the uh, frontal lobes are involved in um, uh, this kind of behavior. So the frontal lobes themselves, they have uh, the motor cortex. The motor cortex is this strip here, and this is involved in kind of generating body movements, and the, the part before it is involved in kind of planning body movements. Uh, the, the kind of mirror neuron system and so on would be part of that. So the part of the, the, the frontal lobes is seen as being involved in cognitive control is what's called the prefrontal cortex, 
which you often kind of see as PFC in the literature, prefrontal cortex. And this is the bit of the frontal lobes in front of your kind of motor regions that, that, that are involved in other uh, things. Um, you will also, when you kind of read the literature, you'll kind of see these numbers. In fact, these, you get these numbers all over the brain. They're called Brodmann areas. And it's just one way of kind of dividing the cortex into different regions. <coughs> From our point of view, I won't really talk about uh, these numbers, but I, I'll make a division between uh, several parts of the, the prefrontal cortex. So at, the, at one level, the, the, your frontal lobes have got three, each hemisphere has got three surfaces. Uh, you've got your lateral surface, so the bit that's kind of closest to the, the skull here. Uh, so that's your lateral, and that's what's shown uh, there. In this one, you've got your medial surface, so the inner side, so where your corpus closer when you can pull it apart, you've got your medial uh, surface there. And then you've got your orbital surface, so the orbits refer you know, to the eyeballs, and it's above uh, the skull this way, above. Uh, so you've got the, the lateral, the medial in the middle, and the orbital here. And these are, are kind of related to somewhat different functions, although uh, that's something that's kind of been learnt about uh, over time. So the, the lateral one is seen as being involved in more uh, cognitive, or what you might want to call kind of cold cognition, whereas the, the, your orbital and the, the surrounding bits on the kind of inner surface are involved in kind of emotions and regulating social behaviour. And this is one of the things that we'll talk about here. So you've already got this anatomical division that does map on, to some extent, onto functions. And then, of course, we've got the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, and that's something that I will uh, talk about as well. So most people know about Paul Phineas Gage, and we'll, we'll come uh, back, back to him before, but he was somebody who had uh, a brain injury in which um, there was an explosion with dynamite, and the dynamite blew an iron stick effectively up uh, through uh, from behind his eye up through the top of his skull and kind of landed uh, you know uh, tens of meters behind him uh, at the time he was still able to kind of walk and talk despite having this big uh, hole in his head uh, the fact that it was kind of hot probably helped to seal the wound as well you know his brain to lose out it kind of uh, just held into place with this. but anyway he shows this kind of personality change as a result of having his frontal lobe damage he, you know uh, he's kind of indifferent to his friends and patients and obstinate, uh, poor, uh, unable to kind of plan his life, so kind of not employable, not reliable, uh, you know, kind of, it's probably numerate, but then kind of values things in odd ways, so, you know, interested in a collection of pebbles and wouldn't sell them for a thousand dollars. And this is kind of your classic uh, frontal lobe syndrome, if you will, of having these kind of poor decisions, uh, unable to kind of organize your life uh, and so on. But as we'll see, the, the situation's a little bit more complex than that. But by and large, this is when people say, oh, you know, that they, it's kind of frontal lobe damage. You, you can see it in, uh, the, well, the interesting thing here is that you might kind of see this behavior in normal people as well. Here we actually know that it's triggered by, uh, you know, damage uh, to the brain. So people who've had car crashes, for instance, often have this as well. Your frontal lobes are very kind of, fragile with this, and also they might be more talkative, less reliable at work, uh, and so on, and you know, uh, the damage comes from what's up, what is there. So how is this kind of studied in the lab? I, I'll kind of go through a, a set of tasks that have seemed to be really important for uh, executive function. I've kind of divided them into these domains. So task setting and problem solving, overcoming potent or habitual responses, switching between tasks, and doing two tasks at the same time. <coughs> So task setting and problem solving. So this is what's kind of related to a lot of idea, ideas about intelligence. And here I talk about fluid intelligence, which is kind of doing novel things as opposed to uh, things like cultural knowledge, knowing who wrote Hamlet, know, you know, doing arithmetic and things like this. So it's to do with kind of thinking on your feet uh, type of uh, problems. But we'll say more about that. This is the kind of test that, that have been done. So it's based on... Uh, that you've got this position here, and you've got to get it to that one there. Uh, and uh, so it's similar to this task called the Tower of Hanoi, in which you've got large circles and uh, large ones and smaller ones, and you have to put them on top of each other, but following a rule that you can't put a big one or a small one or whatever. But to do this, uh, there are so, so many moves that you can do. So 
in order to get the, uh, the red one here. Obviously, you've got to move the green one out of the way. To move the green one out of the way, you've got to move the red one out of the way and so on. So, uh, so here, that would be a five move one. To get from here to there, you've got to make five different moves. That's a four move solution, two moves. So you can kind of have different levels of difficulty. And what you find is that patients with uh, damage to the prefrontal cortex, they take a lot more moves. And what that effectively means is that they're not, uh, we talked about the frontal lobes as being involved in working memory. And what it means is that most people would figure out the solution in their head before they actually go and execute it on the beads themselves. Whereas here they would move a bead and it's almost as if they're executing, they're doing the problem kind of stage by stage rather than planning through the different moves and dividing it into different subcomponents. And this means that they, they do get there eventually, but they take a lot more moves. So it's almost as if they're not planning and, and working uh, solutions out in their head, they're working it out on the fly. So this would be a visuospatial task. Sorry, did I use my memory stick open? Uh, no, you didn't. I wonder if somebody else took it from... Oh, what's the... Is that yours? Two on... Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Um, so that was the kind of visual spatial so This is a verbal one. So how many camels in Holland? When I kind of Google this and find another picture, there's a book called How Many Camels Are in Holland. It's about somebody, uh, somebody's kind of outsiders and their, their kind of brain problems and so on. But it, it's an item in this test. So again, the, the point here is that this. Uh, if you think about the distinction between automatic and controlled behaviour, there is no automatic answer to that. It's not something that anybody would have reasonably kind of learnt in, in school. So in order to get a reasonable answer, you have to engage in some kind of problem solving. Camels are not native in Holland. There are probably some camels in there in zoos. How many zoos are there likely to be in Holland? How many camels are there likely to be in the zoo? So you can get to a reasonable answer probably. Yeah, I don't know what the answer is. But, but there are different kind of gradations of answer, uh, you know, and if you say a hundred or a thousand or whatever, then you end up, you know, uh, get, getting four points. Whereas if you're kind of, I, I, I've forgotten what the correct answer is, it's naught to 20, I think it's seen as being correct, or five to 20, something like this. Uh, this is another test here in which the, you might think, well, it's automatic, but it's actually very hard. So if I just give you, you know, 30 seconds to do it. So if you have to think of words beginning with the letter F, so I'll give you 30 seconds to do this in your head. Okay, so I don't worry about this. But you've imagined that you know thousands of words, but actually getting them out in that situation is pretty hard, isn't it? Uh, and what people do is that, again, they kind of almost problem solve. They'll kind of think of say one word and then they think of something that's similar to that word or they kind of go through the animals beginning with F. So they, again, these words do not just pop out automatically. You kind of need to impose a, 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 what's called a task set or you need some kind of strategy for getting them out, uh, if you will. So even though you can speak fluently, when you're asked to kind of generate them in this artificial way, uh, you, you, it breaks down. Again, th this is impaired after damage to the frontal lobes, even though language per se isn't, so vocabulary knowledge doesn't go down, but your ability to pull them out flexibly uh, goes down. So this uh, is uh, what we call problem solving. And again, this is related to, um, to, to what we think of as intelligence. So what we find is that a lot of our tests of uh, executive functioning correlates with more standard tests of intelligence particularly what we call fluid intelligence, so problem solving. So Raven's matrices, for instance, uh, when you perform Raven's matrices, you activate the same set of regions involved in a lot of executive functions tests. So here, you have to say which one goes in it. Let's figure it out together. So we've got the answer here. Shout it out when you've got it. One, and four. I think it's four. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's four, but I had to go to So here you have, it's kind of a bit of working memory. You've got three, dimen three dimensions to hold to mind. You've got shape, orientation, and size here. And you have to kind of work your way through this problem set. And uh, the people, surprisingly, you can only do this with about three or four dimensions. Once you get beyond that, uh, people really struggle uh, with this. And even with three, you know, people vary in their speed and so on. But anyway, your ability to do that correlates with 
uh, executive functions. And so, so in a way, a lot of executive functions are kind of the tests of this sort of intelligence. And you also get the parietal loads as well. So uh, Duncan refers to it as the multiple demand network. And what he means by this is that it's used in lots of intelligent behavior and not just you know, in, uh, in other things. But what you don't find is that, so if you damage your frontal lobes, you can pour on this kind of test of intelligence but not what's called crystallized intelligence. So on the way, it's things like cultural knowledge, who wrote Shakespeare, doing maths, for instance, uh, kind of th these kind of block design problems as well are often not affected by damage to the front of the So only some measures of intelligence, not others. <coughs> so the second one is um, to do with uh, really the, uh, the concept of inhibition. The idea that in order to do something novel or, or different, you have to suppress your automatic uh, tendencies. And the kind of classic example of this is the Stroop test. So here, you have to suppress uh, activating the meaning of words and reading. So the idea is that reading is a more uh, automatic response to seeing a word than naming the colour. So in order to name the colour, you have to suppress something that is uh, kind of grabbing your attention and wanting to be read out, if you will, uh, here. So you're, you're having to uh, say red, green, yellow, blue, yellow, white, here. Uh, and, and again, it damages certain parts of the frontal lobes and impairs your ability to do the, uh, the, the, the color name version <coughs> of the word name version, not the automatic version of doing that. Uh, and you can kind of see this in other kinds of symptoms as well. Uh, so in terms of uh, actions, for instance, uh, sometimes patients sort of do what's called perseveration, so they carry on doing something even though they've done it. So they might have completed their goal, which is to make a cup of tea, and then they go and make another one. So it's almost as if, uh, having done it, that they need to inhibit the task and say, right, that's no longer relevant, but they carry on uh, doing this kind of stereotype behavior. A uh, utilization behavior is that any objects that they see, they kind of act on. So they walk past the light switch, they do this. They uh, see a pair of glasses, they put them on. There's a famous image, if you Google it, of a patient with frontal lobe damage wearing three or four pairs of glasses. You know, if there were four pairs of glasses, you would just get a or get a pen, and you would kind of, you know, do this. So it's, it's almost that the actions associated with objects kind of grab their uh, attention and use, even when they're not relevant. So you kind of have to suppress them and say, well, that is not an action that's uh, with goals. So it's kind of balancing what you need to do and what the, what the objects are shouting out to do with them. So it's almost as if the objects win and your goals lose, uh, and you just get driven by uh, these kinds of behavior. And obviously this is also related to the, the notion of impulsivity. So that's another kind of classic symptom of uh, frontal lobe damage. Uh, and here often tasks are that you, um, you know, that you, whenever you see uh, uh, 25 letters of the alphabet, you press uh, a button, but whenever you see the letter M, you don't press the button. So you're kind of going like this all the time, then you have to kind of withhold. And it is quite hard if all the time you're pressing it, then you have to kind of slow down and uh, pull away. And again, the, the tendency is just to keep on going and not withhold on the certain part. So those are go, no go. So, task switching or switching between one task is again a little bit related to number two. So in order to switch from doing one thing to another one, the idea is that you have to inhibit the old task and kind of activate the new task. Okay? Uh, here this is uh, not really switching between tasks, it's kind of switching between rules within one task. And it's something called the Wisconsin card sorting task. You probably come across it a little bit in year one in your cognition and clinical context, and so we'll, we'll talk about it quite a bit uh, today. And the idea is that what you get is a pile of cards here, and you have to sort them according to three rules. Uh, but you're not told what the rules are, and you're not told which rule is correct at any given time. Okay? So how could you do this? You've got three different ways of doing it. So here you can put... Um, you can sort by number, so here you've got two to two, or you can sort by shape, so here you've got cross to cross, or you can short, sort by color, so here you've got blue to blue. Okay? And what you would do is that initially you just um, you just choose a way to sort, and the experimenter <coughs> says correct. Okay? So you've also got one here which isn't correct in any sense. As well. <coughs> 
So you can put it there. So here you're sorting by number. So you put the two on the two pile. Here you're sorting by number again. So you put the three on the three pile. And the experimenter says, yes, that's correct. Here you're still sorting by number. So you put the number four on the, the number four pile. Here you, you still think you're sorting by, uh, by number. So you try and put the number two on the number two. And all of a sudden the experimenter says, no. Okay, and at this point, you have to then switch uh, to either sorting by shape or sorting by color. And you have to decide what the rule is, and then uh, you, you kind of follow, follow on. So the, the switches are quite unpredictable, and, and the patient has to infer uh, the rule. So it might be here, uh, all of a sudden, you're, you then sort by uh, color instead of by number. So you have to switch between, between one rule and another rule. Uh, so you have to inhibit the old rule and kind of activate and hold in mind uh, a, a new rule. And what you find is that patients with uh, frontal lobe damage are impaired on this uh, task. Uh, and what they tend to do is, well, th there's lots of errors you can do, but often they separate, they go back to the old rule. They don't switch rules in quite the same way. This kind of thing can also be used in uh, normal participants, and there are various other kind of task switching paradigms you can do, where you can measure uh, activity in the brain, for instance, or apply TMS, or, or other purely kind of cognitive measures. So here, this is a task switching paradigm, where you've effectively got two things. One is that you either um, say whether a letter is a consonant or, or a vowel, or say whether a um, uh, I think a digit is odd or even. And what you do is that whenever, um, here it's predictable, because you, you see an item here, then you see it there, then here, then here. So you always know when the rule changes. So you go here to doing a letter task, so here you say it's G, here you say it's E, then you switch to a digit task, and here you say it's um, odd, uh, even, here you say it's odd, and then you switch back there. So what it means is that that cell and that cell here, you end up switching, and these cells here are to do with uh, maintaining the rule, okay? Okay, so that's a switch from there to there, that's a switch from here to here, and that's maintaining the rule. So you can compare these different types of trial. And what you find is, is when you switch between one thing and another, that you really slow down at kind of making the new judgment. So swapping between judging letters uh, and judging digit, digits, making decisions about them, uh, that you've got this cost in reaction time. So here, this is your 200 milliseconds slower uh, at, uh, at switching uh, between them relative to the trials in which you stay uh, within the same task. And what you've got on this axis is the interval bef in between the tasks. So even if you give somebody a few seconds, so after they've made their response, they know that they're going to change the task they're still slow at responding. So it's almost as if even giving people, you know, three, four, five seconds of preparation, they still need, this before they see the stimulus, they're still slowed when the stimulus appears, okay? And this is what's termed the switch cost, in effect. So there are other things you can do with this, is that you can compare uh, switch trials, so that one and that one, against nonsense switch trials, either in reaction times or in terms of brain structures. Uh, you can literally see what's happening in fMRI on the switch trials relative to non-switch trials, uh, and show that various regions in your frontal lobes uh, are activated. <coughs> now, the, the, the interesting thing here is, um, what's, why is it that you've got this particular switch cost from switching from one thing to another? And there are two possibilities is that one thing that you have to do is that you have to kind of activate your new task. And the other thing you have to do is that you have to switch off your old task. So, uh, and of course you have to do both, but what is it that gives rise to the cost? Well, the answer seems to be that it's more to do with inhibiting the old task, it's switching the old task off rather than setting the new one. This contributes to most of the uh, slowing in the reaction time and most of the activity in the brain when you measure it with fMRI. How do we know that? Well, the, the reason we know that is that it's much easier to switch from doing something hard. Uh, no, it's harder to switch from doing something hard to doing something easy. 
And to me, that kind of sounds counterintuitive. So for instance, if you're talking in your, um, yeah, okay, the examples on this. So uh, greater switch costs when switching from hard uh, to easy. Um, so here it would be that if you're talking in your second language, uh, you find it harder to switch to your first language. And if you're talking your first language, you switch the other way around. So it's almost as if uh, getting rid of something that is less automatic takes more effort um, uh, with that. Let's <coughs> check that I've got these right way around. It's definitely this here. So uh, what you find here is that getting rid of the um, a more difficult task uh, and going to an easy one is, uh, is harder because you're having to suppress a difficult have I got that the right way around? I will have a think about this. There's something <laughs> fishy about these slides. Uh, the answer is definitely inhibiting the old task. Think about when I've got this the right way around. It's very kind of letting it. Uh, fMRI studies, uh, again, you can compare the switch trials versus the non switch trials uh, and show difference in the brain region. But you can also switch uh, tasks in various ways and show that different parts of the front lobes involve. So in some cases, you can just switch the responses. So instead of pressing your left hand with that and your right hand with this, you just swap the responses around that you use your other fingers, for instance. Or alternatively, you can swap the stimulus that you attend to. So maybe in one, you, you switch from attending to, uh, to a color to attending to the word, for instance. Uh, but you keep the same kind of responses. And you can show that different networks are involved in between switching from the, the stimulus versus switching uh, your, your responses around, for instance. So it's not the case that there's one general resource for switching between different uh, rules. <coughs> so that's switching between tasks. And uh, multitasking is effectively trying to hold in mind lots of tasks at the same time. Uh, and clearly it is related to, to task switching in a way. The idea is that you, um, you maintain multiple goals rather than just hold one goal in mind. But, but the two are completely separate in terms of their functionality. But this is a test that's been used again on patients with frontal lobe damage called the six elements test. And basically what you have are six different tests. So one is that you have to, um, to do some maths problems, uh, one is that you have a series of pictures that you have to write down the names. Others is kind of uh, listening to a tape and kind of writing down what, what's on it. Uh, but the point is, is that you have to, the rules are that you have to do as many of these tasks as you can in the, in the, the two minutes or however long it is that, that's available. But each of the tasks takes about a minute and a half to do or two minutes. So you have to stop yourself and kind of move on to the others. And what you find is that um, patients with frontal lobe damage can do each of these tasks in isolation, but when they're asked to try and do all the tasks within a few minutes, that they struggle to do that. They don't uh, try enough of them, they don't kind of stop themselves, they carry on with the tasks that they start. So again, coming back to the orchestra analogy, it's almost as if each instrument is quite capable of playing by itself, but moving from one instrument to another and being able to coordinate uh, them in this limited time. Uh, it goes down uh, as a result of doing that. So how can we account for uh, this set of behavior? What's the kind of a general model uh, of executive functions or cognitive control? So for many years, the, the best available model has been what's uh, called the SAS model, or the Supervisory Attentional System of uh, well, Tim Chalice and his uh, collaborators. And this model is still around, but it's kind of been revised over the years for, for reasons that I'll explain. <coughs> um, the idea here is um, it's basically that you have some system that is a biasing system. So it, it's, it effectively controls the other models, not uh, by effectively biasing them to either be a, a little bit on or a little bit off. But the modules themselves kind of choose which one is going to engage with the action. So if you've got various things that you could do, the idea is that you've got a biasing system that looks at your current goals and says, this is what you want to do. 
and it kind of activates one of the modules out of the whole set of the modules and then all the modules themselves are effectively competing to see which one is the most active and the most active one is the one that you do. So this is one way of thinking about it. So here, imagine that you've got lots of different goals. So it could be lots of objects on a table that you could interact with. Um, and these objects would trigger, say, an action. Put your glasses on, press a switch, eat me, whatever. The, the idea is that, that they kind of have a set of automatic responses that go with them. And what effectively you have here is um, some kind of competition, some kind of competitive element that all the different kind of stimuli and actions are competing with them. And the most activated one is the, the one that you do, the one that kind of passes into your uh, motor system, if you will, and that's the, the thing that you do, the thing that you act on. Uh, and you've got this system here that effectively just chooses which is the most active. And the key thing for this model is that you've effectively got two sources uh, of activation that, that are competing to see which is the winner. You've got one which is coming from the environment, and you've got one that's coming effectively from the top down, this kind of supervisory attentional system. So your supervisory attentional system is kind of like your, your frontal uh, lobes, the things that hold in mind your current goals, hold in mind the current task. And what you've got here is effectively the bottom up. So actions that say, when you see a word, you read it, for instance, because that's your automatic behavior. And what you effectively need to do is kind of figure out who's going to win. Is it going to be the automatic behavior, or is it going to be the top-down kind of control behavior, the thing that you need to do, rather than the thing that the stimulus is telling you to do. Uh, so the stimulus might be to say, read the word, and the task, your, your goal is not to read the word, it's to say the color name and the screw test. Okay? So the idea is that when you damage your frontal lobes, what happens is you put a big cross through this, and you just work in this kind of more autopilot mode. You respond to things that you previously responded to, you respond to objects in the environment, you do the most automatic, the most habitual, the most easy thing, rather than the thing that you ought to do, the thing you want to do, the thing you're told to do, uh, and, and so on. And this would explain some of the kind of socially disinhibited behavior that, you know, you, you've got money, you want to spend the money, and your ability to kind of suppress that tendency with your kind of planning and goals goes down. Um, so the idea is that all actions are kind of this trade-off between your goals and your impulses, if you, if you will. Um, and the other thing uh, about this is that it kind of gets out of the notion of um, a conductor conducting the orchestra, but who's in the conductor's head telling him to conduct? You know? The idea is that you haven't got a conductor, you've just got a system of different biasing influences, where one is more environmental biases uh, from the objects and the stimuli, and one is more goal-driven uh, biases uh, from your kind of... Uh, frontal system that kind of sets up tasks, uh, implements goals, holds in mind the current uh, tasks and so on. Um, and the, the, the control behavior is kind of the sum of these parts. Okay. So the, the SAS model was really kind of the gold standard in the field up until about the, the 1990s. And in the 1990s, it was quite clear that there were things that were wrong with it. But it's kind of taken another 10 years since the 1990s to figure out what, what a better solution is. So you've kind of got this, this idea that it explains a lot. Then understand there are chicks in it, then knowing that there's a problem, and then thinking, well, OK, what's a correct model? And really, the, the rest of the lecture is kind of uh, updating you on that. So like I say, the, this kind of way of thinking about ex executive functions it explains most of the, the existing data. So Wisconsin card sorting, street tests, social disinhibition, and so on. But even so, it, it was known that there were a few problems with this. So there are some patients who have damage to uh, the frontal lobes who pass all the ex tests of executive function that that, you know, the standard ones, like the Stroop test, they pass that. The Wisconsin cards, they pass that. 
but in daily life, they're very bad at organizing their, their lives. They, they spend money recklessly, they lose their friends, they don't keep in touch with their family, uh, this kind of uh, behavior. So this was known uh, for quite a while that these patients exist. And it was also known that you can pass some tests, but not others. So in the early 1990s, it was shown that there are some patients who are really bad at multitasking, but they pass the Stroop test, they pass the Wisconsin card sorting test, and so on. How can you explain this? Well, one solution is that the model isn't incorrect. It's just that these tests aren't good enough. So nobody said that the Wisconsin card sorting test was a perfect test, uh, or that the Stroop test is a perfect test. So there's always a bit of a cop-out that, well, you know, so what if it's not picking up on real-world kind of disinhibition? This is just a laboratory test. It's never going to be 100% uh, specific. So it's not that the theory is incorrect. It's just that the tests aren't perfect. Nobody said they were ever perfect. And that the, this is basically a way out uh, of the, these kinds of problematic data. But the issue is, is that there's um, subsequent evidence that shows that this isn't um, uh, correct. That in fact there is some evidence that just won't fit into this kind of unitary model of a single biasing system versus bottom-up inputs from the environment. And really what I want to do is kind of switch and spend most of the lecture kind of talking about this contradictory evidence and, and what, it, what it means. And really, a lot of the driving force from um, for, for kind of revising this basic idea of executive functions comes from a better understanding of where they are in the brain, and understanding that different parts of the frontal cortex are actually processing different kinds of material or are performing different kinds of computation. Uh, and again, in the 80s and 90s, when a lot of these models were proposed, there wasn't this kind of detailed understanding of where things were happening in the brain brain imaging hadn't really taken off in a big way, uh, and the patients often have very big lesions, so you couldn't say exactly where things were going on. <clears throat> so I'll talk about various kinds of anatomical divisions. The first one that, that I'll talk about is to do with the outside of your frontal lobes, your lateral surface, versus the, uh, the orbital, the, this kind of bottom bit there, and kind of the inner bit that curves in. So the orbital and what's called the ventromedial, the kind of inner. Uh, part of that. So uh, this bit in blue is kind of on the inner surface, but it kind of folds like this uh, on the inner surface. So one suggestion is that these are implementing rather different functions. So this is a test done by uh, researchers at Cambridge in the 1990s, which is based loosely on the Wisconsin card sorting test, and it, it's a real uh, not there to kind of explain, but the, the principles are quite simple once you've got it. Okay? So it's effectively a task switching paradigm in which you learn one rule and then you have to switch to another rule. That's the basic idea uh, behind this test. It's also developed for marmosets, so a species of primates as well. Uh, so, it's, so this particular study is done on non-human animals. So what you've got here is that you've got uh, pairs of stimuli um, there and what you have to do initially uh, that the animals are taught just to respond to one uh, one of the items in that and some of them are taught to respond to the shapes so here they're told or, or that they're taught that they will get a bit of a reward when they see this uh, Pac-Man uh, like shape but they don't get a reward when they see this obviously another set of animals were taught to respond to the lines and not to respond to the shape. So each of these stimuli is a compound stimuli. It's got two different uh, dimensions. Now I'll just talk about the shape uh, thing. With that. Okay. <clears throat> so what they do is that they, uh, the animals learn uh, the, this kind of rule uh, to criteria. They're just taught that whenever they, it's like a touch screen, whenever they touch this particular shape, they get a reward. Uh, when they touch that shape, they, they, they don't. So it's a simple uh, learning. What then happens is that they have damage to two parts of the frontal lobes. One set of animals damages their uh, orbitofrontal cortex, and one damages their lateral uh, frontal cortex. 
And then, okay, so you've got the learning phase, then you, the, uh, they have the brain damage, the, the neurosurgery, and then they have another test. And the test then is to learn a different rule, okay? And what, so one learning rule is what they do is that they simply just swap the rules around. So before, whenever you saw this shape, you got uh, the food. And now, when they see this shape, they don't get food. When they see that shape, they get food. So the reward contingencies have been swapped. What was previously rewarded is not rewarded, and what was unrewarded is rewarded. What you find is that the animals with lesions to the orbitofrontal cortex cannot switch the rewards around. Whereas patients with or the, the animals with damage to the lateral frontal cortex can learn this rule shift. They can flexibly swap the rewards uh, from the Pac-Man to the star. Okay. So one set of animals can do this, one can't. And then the complementary set can do this. Now here, they switch to different shapes. Uh, so it's not the same shapes. So you've got a completely new set of shapes, but here you switch the rule from going from the shape to the lines. So here you have to ignore the blue heart and just respond to the, the, the lines here. So you have to learn that all of a sudden the task is nothing to do with shapes, it's about lines. Okay? And what you find is that animals with lesions to the orbitofrontal cortex can learn this even though they can't learn that. Whereas animals with lesions to the lateral frontal cortex can't learn this even though they can learn that. So here you've got a, what, what seems like a similar uh, task involving kind of learning which is a rewarded dimension and which isn't. But you've got this complementary pattern uh, that uh, is involved in kind of either switching uh, which part of the stimulus is rewarded versus switching uh, between something that was rewarded that isn't now, kind of extinction learning, if you will, but that something that was good is no longer good. Uh, and the idea is that your orbitofrontal cortex is involved particularly in this kind of reward or kind of emotion-based uh, processing and knowing whether something that was previously rewarded is currently rewarded, for instance. Whereas switching between one dimension and another, like switching between colour and shape in the Wisconsin car sorting, is more to do with your lateral frontal cortex. This is kind of often like cold cognition, switching between colour and shape and so on ignoring something that was previously good that was no longer good. What about uh, uh, human patients with damage to the orbitofrontal cortex? What we'll do is we'll have a look at uh, this video from uh, Damasio's group. It's quite long. It's, uh, it's about seven minutes, but I, it's actually worth uh, looking at. So it, it covers quite a bit. And you get to check out Damasio's hairdo, which is... <laughs> in 1861, one of the most celebrated patients in medical history died in San Francisco. His name was Phineas Gage, and 13 years earlier, he'd been the victim of a freak accident. He was buried without autopsy. But in 1994, using computerized brain imaging techniques, the husband and wife team of Hannah and Antonio Damasio performed a virtual autopsy using an electronic scalp. Working with his railroad gang in Vermont, Gage was dynamiting large rocks when a tamping rod, more than a yard long and an inch and a quarter in diameter, blasted up through his cheek, behind his eye, and out of the top of his skull. Astonishingly, he survived. He was still intelligent. His language and memory were intact. But he was a radically different person. As his colleagues put it, Gage was no longer Gage. The likable, hardworking, socially responsible character became untrustworthy, used profane language, and lied to his friends. It was as if the rod had destroyed the moral compass in his brain. The Damasio's detective work struck an immediate chord because several of their patients at the University of Iowa were, in a sense, modern Phineas Gages. We have a large number of patients, neurological patients, who as a result of diseases have damage in certain sectors of the brain. It's a little hard to picture it, but you can think of them especially in the front part of the brain. 
And when there is damage in those areas, what happens is that patients become unable to read certain social clues out in society. So they will be, they will have difficulty picking up uh, the significance of a facial expression or the significance of, for instance, a shrugging of the shoulders. Uh, and likewise, those patients will also not be able to perform uh, in relation to what is expected uh, in terms of the social contract. Meet Joe. Until a stroke in 1989, he was a high-energy, creative outdoorsman with a cheerful, fun-loving personality. Now, according to his wife, Dee, he's always in neutral. Well, now. <coughs> this experiment gets to the heart of Joe's problem. Woman and a little boy. <coughs> the electrodes are recording his skin conductance response, a measure of his emotional state. Picture of a skinny man. How skin? Awful skinny. Somebody iced him. The man burning himself. Typically, people generate a strong skin conductance response to the disturbing pictures, but not to the routine bland <coughs> ones. And yet, no matter what the picture, Holocaust victim or smiling child, Joe's response is flat, outside and in. Intellectually, he understands what he's seeing, but emotionally, he doesn't connect. Like Phineas Gage, Joe has lost key components of his social brain. The evolved mechanisms that, behind the scenes, smoothly process and integrate reason and emotion have been damaged. The goal of the game is to guess at which decks you can make the most money off of. To test his ideas about the social brain, Damasio uses experiments designed with his colleague Antoine Bechara. They're called the gambling experiments. In front of you, there are four decks of cards. You're hooked up to a polygraph machine and told to keep turning over cards from any of the four decks. I'll give you some money each time you select a card. With every card, you win play money. Two of the decks pay $100, but they have an unexpected sting in the tail. You might have to pay the experimenter, sometimes as much as $1,250. With the other two decks, you win only $50, but the possible penalty is much smaller, less than $100 on average. The goal of the game is to make as much money as you can, so it has some of the same elements as the game of life. Uncertainty, some risk, punishment and reward, and a blend of reasoning and intuitions. You win $50, but you lose 50 cents. Initially, I did what most people do, favor the two high-paying decks. That is, until the experimenters started demanding big penalties. So you owe me $50. Having learned my lesson, I eventually curbed my gambling impulses and shuffled over to the safety of the other two low-payment, low-punishment decks. You win $100. Typically, over 100 plays, a normal subject will retreat to the safer decks about 70% of the time. Damasio's frontal lobe patients do the exact opposite. By halfway through the game, they're often bankrupt, which has happened to some of them in real life, following their brain damage. Now, how can their judgment, their prediction of future consequences... Okay, so, we'll, we'll, so, this is um, Damasio's uh, theory uh, to, to do with the orbitofrontal cortex. So the idea here is that you've got this distinction between the lateral surface, which is involved in kind of, uh, well, kind of cold cognitive intelligence, the Raven's matrices, deciding which circle and square goes there, versus your kind of more social intelligence, your gut instincts, your kind of reasoning and dealings with, uh, with people, which are more to do with uh, your orbitofrontal cortex. So his claim about what the orbitofrontal cortex do is that they have what he calls somatic markers, which are basically, um, kind of like uh, contextual representations of whether something is uh, likely to be rewarded or not. Um, so the idea is that you've kind of almost got this emotional memory as to whether something is good or bad, 
and that this kind of emotional memory reinstates effectively a, a bodily feeling, you know, a sweating response or, or whatever, and that this guides your behavior. It makes you kind of empathic, it makes you respond uh, to, to stimuli appropriately, it makes you kind of curb risky tendencies, uh, for instance, would be uh, the claim here. And he argues that these somatic markers may be conscious or unconscious, so whether or not you know your, so people often stop the gambling because of their sweating response before they know or can articulate what the rules of the game are. So it's, it's not necessarily a conscious response to do this, it's more an intuitive response. So this is his kind of uh, gambling task here. So what you've got is four uh, deck, decks of cards, uh, A, B, C, and D. And what, what you find is that the, um, so one of the interesting things about it is that the, the bad decks, the ones that uh, you lose money on, are initially rewarded strongly. So here, for instance, on the first turn, you get $100, and the other ones there get uh, $50. But over time, what you find is that these uh, are far more punishing than they are rewarding. You end up giving money away. So you, your strategy is effectively to move away from A and B towards C and D, and this is what he's describing there. <clears throat> what you find is that most people start, when they're thinking about picking from a risky deck, they have this uh, skin conductance response, it's kind of anticipatory, so before they've done it, they, uh, they, they show this response. Whereas uh, patients with damage to the, uh, the ventromedial orbital or frontal cortex don't, but they, do, they can show skin conductance response sometimes, so if you give them an electric shock, they can do. It's not always, you know, it's often kind of in more social uh, situations. We'll, we'll talk about it maybe when we come to the papers. But one of the key things about this is that um, performance on this task doesn't go well with other tests of executive functions like the Wisconsin card sorting where you're swapping between color and shape and number or the Stroop test in which you're swapping between reading a word and uh, saying the color of a word, for instance that these two effectively double dissociate. And what's interesting is the performance on this test, it, it seems to correlate more with real world behavior, your Phineas Gage type uh, behavior. So Phineas Gage, um, if you think about his tamper guide, it kind of went through the bottom and through the middle. But actually the, the edges, the, the lateral prefrontal cortex wasn't so much damaged uh, with that. So uh, although we know nothing about Phineas Gage's performance on executive functions tests, based on the anatomy of other patients, we do have this clear idea. Um, how, do, how is this test working? So one suggestion is that this is pretty much the same as reversal learning that we saw in uh, monkeys and that we do in kind of mice and, and stuff like this uh, uh, with that. And the reason why it's kind of reversal to learning is that the bad decks initially start out good. You get a, a good reward with them. And you kind of almost end up in this gangless fallacy of, well, they started off good, so they're going to be good again in a minute, uh, kind, of, kind of thing. Or that you can't stop going back to what was a pre previously good reward. And what you find is that when you get rid of these initial uh, biases, that in fact the, the, the patients do okay. So it's almost learning that something that gave you a good kind of reward is no longer rewarding and making this shift seems to be the case. But the interesting thing is that this does correlate well with uh, real-world social dysfunction after uh, frontal lobe uh, injury, that this kind of uh, decision making. There's a whole debate as to whether this is really involving conscious versus unconscious decisions as well, uh, which I won't go into, but it's quite interesting. So we'll, we'll talk about this uh, after uh, a 10 minute break and then talk about other uh, divisions. So there, I gave you a paper to read and we will go through that uh, after a little break. So let me just quickly go back to this slide. I can upload uh, correctly. So the, yes, this was fine up until um, the, the examples, which I put in the wrong way around. So here, yes, it's um, so uh, it's harder to go from your second language to your first language, okay? And you might imagine, well, because you're going to your first language, it's going to be easier, but it's not. The reason why it's hard to go from your second language is that your second language is more demanding, uh, so to suppress 
those cognitive demands, you have to inhibit them more. And similarly, to go from the, the color naming version of the Stroop, the harder one, uh, uh, it's harder to go from color naming to word naming than vice versa. Because doing the hard task, you have to kind of push the hard task down, uh, if you will. It's, that's uh, the direction in which it goes. Uh, So here, this, the distinction between the orbital and the, uh, the lateral prefrontal cortex is very well accepted. And it doesn't really fit with the SAS model. At least what you need to do with the SAS model is chop it in half. And say so half of the system is dealing with uh, emotional, <coughs> social information. Half of it's dealing with, effectively, uh, cognitive information to do with color, shape, you know, motor actions, that, this kind of thing. Uh, that would be one way of doing it. That, that's kind of how these early studies so envisaged it. That you know, cognitive inhibition can be fractionated in at least two ways. But there's more to it than this. So there's also differences between uh, the right and the left frontal lobes as well, particularly in humans, less so in other species. So it's, it's quite rare to get cognitive laterality in other primates. So this is uh, one example of a theory that suggests that your left and your right frontal lobes are doing different things. It comes from Stuss and Alexander. And Chalice has also effectively incorporated their ideas in his revised SAS model by saying, in fact, you know, his uh, executive uh, you know, uh, biasing mechanism can be subdivided. And they make a distinction between the left and the right hemispheres, uh, the, the lateral uh, side, between setting up a task and then monitoring a task when it's going. Okay? So you're, if you damage your left frontal lobes, you're particularly bad at kind of <coughs> problem solving in which you're not told what to do. So the Tower of London is moving <coughs> these beads, but you're not given a solution. You're just told uh, what the goal is, and you have to kind of figure out a solution. Whereas um, on the right side, what you're impaired at is not finding uh, a solution. It's kind of keeping on the task and not wandering off onto something else. It's kind of maintaining focus uh, on, on a task. So if you damage your left frontal lobe, you're impaired on the Wisconsin card sorting test. If you damage your right frontal lobe, you're impaired. But you, you actually get impaired in slightly different ways. And what you find is that if you damage your left frontal lobes, you're particularly impaired on the Wisconsin card sorting test when you've got this very open-ended version, where you're not told what the three rules are to do the color shape of this. You're not told when the shifts are going to be. Uh, and everything's kind of quite unpredictable. You have to effectively make up the rules of the game yourself. Okay? People with left frontal lobe are particularly bad on that version. If you make it very predictable, so you say, right, the first rule is going to be this. After 10 uh, rule uh, rules, it's going to shift to something else. It will shift to one of these other two things. Okay? The people with the left frontal lobe, actually, they, they don't go down to normal, but they start to do better when you give them this very guided instructions. And it's the ones with the right frontal lobes who then do poor, because it's almost that like they can't keep, they can uh, invent the current rules, but they can't keep on task set. It's almost that, like, oh God, what's the current rule, okay? Uh, so, so you've got this difference between whether or not it is uh, open-ended versus predictable here. Again, patients with damage to the, the left frontal lobes are paired on task switching, those with damage to the right frontal lobes are paired on task switching. And you can say this is evidence, well, you know, it, there is no difference between the left and right. But if you look at um, the, uh, the, the actual patterns between uh, left and right frontal lobe damage, you can show that there are differences in the kinds of behavior and errors that they have. So in task switching, if you've got left damage, you're much slower at setting up the new uh, task. So you're much slower at switching tasks, OK? On the right, um, it's not that you're kind of slow when you're, you're switching. It's all of a sudden you forget what the current rule is and you go back to a previous one. So again, it, uh, you've got these differences uh, as to why people fail on the, these kinds of tasks. So that's kind of consistent with this view. So the left frontal lobe is particularly um, important when you're dealing with very open-ended solutions. Um, so Frith kind of has this theory that links it with uh, free will is kind of his idea of selecting freely between lots of different options as opposed to having an automatic or predetermined option. Uh, so here, the, in blue, this is your left lateral frontal lobes here. 
uh, and in one task, what all this is a, a brain imaging task. It's not to do with brain damage. So normal people, and the task is simply that they they just they can move any finger. They're just given a cue, and they choose which finger to move. And the baseline task is that they're told which finger to move. So simply choosing a finger to move versus being told activates your uh, left frontal cortex, and it's not to do with the hand that you're moving. And you've got the same thing uh, with, in the verbal domain as well. So it's not to do with actions versus words. So you've got a task where you get a cue and then you just say a word uh, versus uh, you get a cue, you see a word written there and you say the word that's given to you. So having to kind of generate a solution very open-endedly, uh, well, a choice of five with your hand, with the words choice of thousands, or, or, or with the letter F, you, well, with the letter F or whatever, you've still got a choice of thousands. So it's, it's something about the open-ended nature of the task that the left hemisphere uh, seems to be more involved with. And if you apply TMS over the left hemisphere rather than the right, uh, again, it, it um, disrupts your ability to be random. So um, here, a, another test that's kind of related to executive function is just generating random digits. So, you know, five, eight, uh, seven, or whatever. And what you find is that when people are asked to generate digits at a fast rate, all of a sudden that they, uh, they stop being random and they go five, six, seven, or that they, they kind of go to automatic sequences. Uh, you know, that they just revert to the automatic retrieval. Um, and what happens is that your left frontal lobes, uh, that they can, as soon as it goes very fast, your left frontal lobe effectively drops off, it stops functioning, and you go into this kind of automatic uh, pilot. So here you've got uh, very fast speeds, you stop being random, and your frontal lobe effectively switches itself off uh, uh, with this, okay? Uh, because you kind of then, uh, you, you're just, you're switching from something that's controlled behavior to automatic behavior. But again, one of the key things here is that this pattern seems to be more to do with your left front <coughs> than your right. Uh, so your TMS would disrupt uh, that pattern. It would make you uh, less random, in effect, but only a, 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 you, you go more into the automatic sequence retrieval. Uh, so if, if the, the left is doing uh, kind of setting up tasks and dealing with open-ended problems, the right is more to do with keeping on tasks, so what, what's often called monitoring, uh, or sustained <laughs> attention. So we've talked about attention in terms of spatial atten attention, kind of finding objects there. Sustained attention is just keeping yourself uh, on a task and remaining uh, uh, focused. <clears throat> or, or kind of checking responses, checking that what you're doing is correct within your current kind of ta goals and task sets and so on. Um, so what you find is that the right front load is kind of involved in kind of task checking, both in perception tasks and memory tasks. So it's not to do whether something is external versus uh, internal. And also when, you, you, when a task is quite uncertain, your normal, uh, in fMRI studies with the normal brain, the right front load is particularly activated. So for instance, in a tip of the tongue state, so you're asked, what's the capital of Peru or something? It's like, God, I know that, what is it? Here, your right frontal lobe is particularly activated when you're trying to uh, monitor whether it's correct, or if you're given an answer, you have to judge that. If you're uncertain of the answer, uh, you're doing that. And if you've got low confidence, it's like, I'm not sure whether this is right. Your right frontal lobe seems to be particularly important for that. So there are these differences between the left and right, but it's not the case that they do completely different functions. It's rather that they uh, do somewhat different things. But, but here, it, it's quite a different kind of claim that's made by the left and the right, that, that's made between the orbital and the lateral. So the orbital and lateral refers to different kinds of information. So emotional and social information versus kind of cold cognitive information. Whereas the left and the right, it's more to do with the nature of what's being uh, computed, uh, the, more to do with the actual nature of the task rather than the information that, that's being processed in, in those heads. What about the front and the back, so posterior to anterior, so here at the back of the front lobe you've got your motor cortex, so are there differences going from front to back in the, the, the brain? Well, the evidence seems to be yes, uh, that you've effectively got uh, 
well, so in various systems, you've got this increase in complexity uh, between them. Uh, so, so this is uh, Kirkland and Summerfield's idea that basically what you've got is more demanding uh, kind of tasks. So, uh, so sensory control here would just be learning to pair arbitrary stimulus and responses. So whenever you see blue, press with your left finger. So these standard boring cognitive psychology experiments. Pairing new stimuli with key presses and so on would be that uh, very simple thing. What you've got here would be kind of more contextual control. So that would be uh, press the left finger when you see uh, a, um, uh, a blue uh, when you see a blue square, but not when it's a blue triangle, for instance. So here it's not a simple stimulus to response mapping. It's a stimulus to response mapping that's contextually dependent. So it's almost as if you've got another level uh, to the, the, the rule and the task that you're performing. And you can show that adding this extra demand, so it's a press left for blue, press left when it's a blue square, not a blue triangle or whatever, would, would, would kind of take you further up your frontal lobes. Episodic control is to do with kind of current rather than previous task demands. So it might be in this block, block press the left button for the, uh, the blue triangle, uh, and then you swap it. So in this block, press the left button for the, uh, the green square. So you're changing the rules all the time. So you have to kind of maintain uh, them there. And then the one at the top is kind of switching between completely different tasks, or holding several tasks in mind, which is probably a better way uh, of describing it. So the idea, you've kind of got this increasing task demands, task complexity, that takes you from the back of the front lobes more uh, uh, to, to the front. So it seems, uh, and the claim that, that's made is that this one here is for kind of holding in mind different tasks, uh, whereas these are kind of involved in the same task. Uh, and this uh, supports other evidence that damaging the, the, the very front of the frontal waves can impair multitasking, dealing with multiple task demands, but not on the tasks of executive function, which have more simple kind of rule mapping, uh, in effect, where you've only got one task. Um, in terms of temporal processing, will we go to branch into sensory or sensory branch? Um, uh, let's think about that. So, yeah, I'm not sure you can do it uh, that way. So, my intuition says, well, it kind of goes from the bottom up, but I, I think it's probably a bit of both. So you need to know what the current rule is in order to feed it back to the response you're making. So I suspect it's a bit of both. Um, in, yes, in terms of the actual kind of time, and this is, this is kind of dealing with the now, and this is dealing with the, the future, is how they kind of do it. So making a current response versus making a future response is kind of how they uh, label it here. But you still need to know the, the current rules. You need to know where you are, whether you're using the rule in this block versus the last block in order to pass your finger on the button. I'm not quite sure that, that I would um, look at it that way. That's certainly how they presented it here, isn't it? That it's, uh, they've made that distinction. So the last one I'll talk about is to do with the anterior cingulate, which is a part of the frontal lobe that kind of lies in the middle of the brain here. And the idea behind this is that this is involved in, particularly involved in response monitoring. So we talked about the right hemisphere is involved in, in monitoring in general. And here it's kind of almost checking uh, to see whether your actions are, are correct. Let me give you an example uh, of that. So it's all, it's, it's the, this region in blue here, kind of on the middle of the brain there. Um, so what you find is that this part of the brain is more active when you make an error than when you get something correct. So the idea is it's almost kind of signaling to the rest of the brain something's gone wrong here. Uh, so, so it's kind of it's not general monitoring or it's not general sustaining attention to a task. It's more kind of troubleshooting and correcting it. Um, is it active when you get told that you're incorrect or when uh, you are incorrect when you don't really Yes, okay, that, yeah, that's, that's um, yeah, 
it's, it relates specifically um, to finding out that you are incorrect yourself. So it's not about feedback. And it's, it's suggested that there are two kinds of uh, mechanisms there. One is kind of if you make an error, you will get it activated. But if you make an error and you know about it, then you get another one. So it's almost as if it can detect an error even if the person doesn't know they've made an error. It can do this. But, but there are set, separate subdivisions. One that seems to track whether the person is sure that they've made an error. But, but it, it, it can respond to an error even when the person hasn't uh, clocked that. But, uh, but there are somewhat different areas that seem to pull, pull apart with that. But it's certainly not about being given feedback about your performance. It's more an internally generated system. So typically, <coughs> what, uh, you know, I guess you've all been a, a research participant uh, in a, a lot of things, but often what you do is you, you know, you're kind of going as fast as you can to get out of the room, but occasionally you press a button and you, you make an error. It's like, oh God, and then you kind of slow yourself down on the next few trials, okay? Uh, because you don't want to, you know, to ruin your friend's experiments or whatever. And, and it, it seems to be the, um, uh, your anterior cingulate that's, uh, uh, that's involved with that. So if you have damaged your anterior cingulate, you don't show the slowing down on what I call the error plus one trial. So the trial after the error is where most people kind of tend to slow down, but they don't do that. And you can compare it on an error plus one trial versus a correct plus one trial here uh, as a baseline. So this seems to be involved in kind of um, either detecting the error or kind of deciding that, that you, know, you need to change your performance on the task as a result of doing that. Um, The other thing that you find, so this is with uh, EEG, is that um, if you make an error, so zero is the time at which you make an error, that you get this um, what's called error-related negativity. So here, uh, this is a, a negativity that occurs you know, around 100 milliseconds after you press the button. So it's like, oh god, that, that was the wrong one kind of thing. And this, you're, you're, you, you kind of have uh, this one here, but again, you can have that uh, even if you don't know it's, it's correct. So this one here, to come back to your point, doesn't seem to strongly reflect whether you know it or not. And there's a later one uh, uh, that, that seems to reflect whether or not you actually spot the error uh, in itself. But, but you get this particular signal. And this seems to originate from this part of the brain. If you do uh, brain imaging, you can compare different trials. And you can show that the, uh, the anterior cingulate responds more on the error trial, but it's your lateral prefrontal cortex that responds on the trial after the error. So it's almost as if you've got this dual kind of interaction that the, uh, the anterior cingulate spots the error and your lateral frontal cortex then kind of implements a change in behavior that says slow down or uh, you know, uh, don't do that. So, so you've got this network that's not just functioning alone, it's almost uh, a signal that the other parts of the frontal lobe then act on to, uh, to change that behavior. Okay. So it suggests it's more involved in detect the detection rather than the correction uh, of the errors. So the reason why uh, monkeys with lesions here don't correct it is probably that they don't correct, uh, detect it. Okay. In that particular study. Um, You also find that it's active not just when you make an error, but when it, it can be more active when there's a potential for error. So things like in the Stroop uh, uh, task, where you kind of have to slow yourself down in order to not be error prone or whatever, you also get the activity. So it's not just when you've made an error. It's kind of more to do with the potential of making an error as well. It seems to be involved in both of these uh, uh, functions. Uh, and, and how the two have kind of reconciled in the same way is still kind of out there for her. Okay. So, so really, I, I kind of started off by telling you, uh, you know, a simple story that the frontal lobes, uh, you know, engages in the, this kind of executive control, and that we can think of it in terms of a biasing influence between bottom-up perceptual process and top-down goals. 
I, I think that that basic idea of thinking about executive function still applies, but I, I think that we have to think about it, uh, the biasing influences uh, and the mechanisms in terms of somewhat different processes. So we have minimally this kind of split between uh, biasing uh, emotional information versus biasing non-emotional information, uh, and also kind of setting up tasks versus holding on to tasks. Um, uh, it seems to be important. And these seem to be part uh, of different regions of the front lobes that weren't really captured by these earlier models. But nevertheless, the spirit of those models still kind of, uh, you know, is there in, in that sense. But it's just rather more complicated, uh, and certainly not a unitary thing. It can be subdivided in various ways.